Good morning. Everyone without reservation is welcome to worship here at Congregational Church of the Valley, United Church of Christ's first worship service of the year 2024. Uh, we are celebrating uh, Epiphany today, though the church season actually began on January 6th. It is the uh, first Sunday after Epiphany, so today we'll talk about the wise men, how they refuse to collaborate with empire. We are glad you have tuned in uh, with us here, and it's our prayer that you experience the presence of Christ Jesus in our worship this morning. Our scripture today is taken from Matthew, the second chapter, verses one through 12. Please hear this again as if for the first time. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men uh, from the east came to Jerusalem asking, uh, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star in the east at its rising and have come to pay homage to him. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet and you Bethlehem, in the land of Judea are by no means least among the rulers of Judea. For from you shall come a ruler who is 
to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen in its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. And now from the book of Romans, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And these authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. May God add blessing to the readings, the understanding of these words. Amen. My sermon title this morning is The Wise Men and Civil Disobedience. Here we are just coming off our holiday season, and yeah, there have probably been some interesting discussions around the dinner tables over the past month or so. People generally avoid mixing politics and religion, but not always. It used to be that these were the two taboo subjects often forbidden in polite conversation. Uh, politics and religion. NPR, as it usually does each year, ran segments on how to direct Thanksgiving table conversations away from the two subjects. Social media influencers also weighed in with creative strategies to move holiday, converse, holiday table conversations onto safer grounds. One woman, Babs, I often enjoy on Facebook, even suggested we play a game by pinning a famous person's name on each guest's back and instead, over dinner, have people ask yes or no questions of one another so that the person can figure out the name of the celebrity he or she is wearing. Engaging in this game, she reasons, will direct the conversations into safe or safer areas. Now, some people during my 16-year career in the ministry have approached me after a sermon saying that I shouldn't get political in church. And I would always respectfully disagree, disagree for this reason. The gospel is intensely political. I would be preaching in nothing but platitudes if I didn't, in some sense, reference politics. The birth, life, and death of Christ were all about upending and challenging the old religious and political order. That's why he was so threatening to the religious and political establishment. That's why Jesus ran afoul of Caesar and the Pharisees, who were essentially the embodiment of politics and religion in a nutshell. And we can even say that politics and religion are what got Jesus crucified. In fact, the very story we celebrate at Epiphany is nothing short of political. We cannot properly understand the gospel and unless we get the backdrop of the first century politics. Let's take a deeper look at that story today. You know, the story about the wise men coming to offer gifts to Jesus. We often think of the story in terms of nostalgia. Our nativity scenes would hardly be complete if the three wise men and their camels weren't in attendance. We think of the pretty Christmas cards 
with their exotic wise men and camels out in the twilight of the desert following that star. What we don't focus on is the nitty gritty political dimensions of the story. Well, this is a story that involves Herod, who was a pretty paranoid character. He quickly put down any perceived threat to his power. Another emperor, Augustus, once said of Herod that he would rather be one of Herod's pigs than one of his sons. Herod had put to death, um, to put to death his sons because of his fear of, of losing power. Herod killed three of his sons, his wife and his mother-in-law. You didn't want to cross this empowered madman. And so when he heard of a possible new king being born, it is consistent with his personality to order all the male children under two years old to be killed. What we learn in our Matthew reading today is that before they went to Bethlehem, the wise men had a meeting with Herod. Presbyterian minister Kate Jones Cologne retells the story in her Sojourners magazine article, When the Wise Men Refused to Collaborate with Empire. She retells it this way. Herod says to them, I have a problem. I need your help. I need uh, to find this child. I suspect he's somewhere in Bethlehem, so I need you to ask around, use your sources, follow your star, then report back to me. Don't worry, I'll treat him well when you find him. Instead, after visiting Jesus, the wise men went home by another road, deciding to avoid Herod and his directive. They did not report back to Herod as asked. Hmm. The wise men disobeyed the king, went against the government of the land. You might be asking, aren't Christians supposed to obey the government? Aren't we subject to it? Well, you might be thinking about that so-called clobber passage in Romans chapter 13 that you heard this morning, verse one, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities that we also, well, you had read, heard that this morning. You know, that, that passage that has been used to crush dissent, to stifle protest, to discourage civil disobedience, and to maintain the status quo ever since. Well, here's the thing. Not only do we need to look to the life of Christ as our most prime example, rather than a verse out of the greater biblical context, but I would suggest that we do not deeply understand the beginning of Romans 13. Paul, in this Romans passage, used the Greek word that we translate as submit. Now, submit literally means to arrange stuff respectfully in an orderly manner underneath. Paul could have, but did not, use the Greek word that means obey. In the Greek language, this makes quite a difference. Obey literally means to conform to follow a command or to kowtow to an authority as a subordinate. What we need to understand is that God ordains government to arrange our lives in an orderly manner. And that's why we should submit to it. But there are times when justice issues arise, especially for the poor and marginalized, and we are called to dissent, like the wise men did by going home on another road and not obediently reporting back to Herod. They knew that to submit did not always mean to obey. These men did not collaborate with empire, and I think the take-home message for us is that we must not obey either when justice issues are involved. We must always be mindful of God's preferential care of the widow, the immigrant, the orphan, the imprisoned, the poor and downtrodden, and the refugee. Because the next thing that happens in the life of young Jesus is that he and his family become refugees in Egypt. The Holy Family has to flee because of the violence that comes upon their own country. And in one of the most terrible accounts of scripture, Herod took out his anger on the infant children of Bethlehem. We sing about that in the lovely but haunting Coventry Carol. Herod the king in his raging, charged he hath that day his men of might in his own sight, all children young to slay. 
Our Matthew scripture today tells us that the wise men had a strong sense of what would be coming. Verse 12, the last verse of our passage this morning says, and having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The, they heeded the communication they got from God. We know that in the biblical canon, God often communicates with humans in dreams. Those wise men paid attention to that and did not write the message off as merely a dream. These three wise men from Asia deliberately disobeyed orders of King Herod. And this was a criminal offense punishable by death. So what they did was not without risk. As such, this was the first recorded act of civil disobedience in the New Testament. And we also know the disciples and apostles were often imprisoned for their acts of civil disobedience. The Presbyterian minister Kate Jones Cologne goes on to say in her Sojourners article that throughout human history, individuals and institutions have had to make difficult and risky decisions in response to unjust directives, especially those directives framed as required cooperation for the good of the country. Resistance can take many forms, dissent, protest, civil disobedience. Sometimes though, what should be done is simply declining to participate. We see that the wise men did not participate. They did not collaborate in facilitating Herod's raid on the Holy Family. God chose to move this salvation story forward through these holy non-collaborators. Somehow the wise men realized, whether by recognizing Herod's duplicitousness or taking seriously the warning that came to them in a dream, that it would be unjust and unwise to serve as Herod's enforcers. And of course, all of this is political. All of this is the backdrop to the gospel story, the story of Jesus. His story is political through and through all of the characters, all of the events, issues, and tensions, and the same types of characters, events, issues, follow us and repeat throughout history. And we have to grapple with them. There's nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes tells us. These themes play out again and again in history, right up through and including today. Leaders are so desperate to cling to power. Immigrants and outsiders are often suspect. All we have to do is examine our own country's attitudes and policies toward refugees and immigrants. Political strong men and women control us by whipping up fear in us. They tell us if we make room for them, then there won't be enough room for us. Would-be leaders find there is much to gain by stirring up such fears. No wonder so many who were once considered the hard right fringe are winning elections worldwide. Italy, Argentina, just to name a few recents among them. It has happened and happens in so many places, in so many times. We look back through history, ethnic cleansing of all types, the Holocaust, the Trail of Tears, on and on it goes. And God's people have often remained silent, hiding be behind a poor understanding of Romans chapter 13, verse 1. The Christian is called to follow God's laws first, even when they clash with empire. Now, mind you, our governments don't always put us into bad positions or oppress, but when they do, we must choose God and all that God ordains above blind obedience. Just because something is lawful, remember, does not make it moral. Slavery was once lawful. The Holocaust back then was legal. Segregation and apartheid were legally sanctioned. And many of today's laws are created to protect corporations and institutions rather than people. One contemporary example involves water. I'm sure you can think of companies that have acquired private water reserves, often to the detriment of ecosystems and local communities. I'm sure you can think of many examples where corporations are privileged over the poor, where the law dictates the ethics. But the biblical narrative, starting with the wise men, shows us that the law must not dictate our ethics. For us, for Christians, God must dictate our ethics. 
We, like the wise men, can refuse to collaborate with empire. We, too, can leave by another road. Ways to do that include boycotts and non-participation, activism, and using our votes. I've often seen our own denominations, clergy and lay members, participate in peaceful protests, highlighting injustices. I've seen Christians from all denominations yell a holy no in the face of evil. And so this is our epiphany for today. We, like the wise men, are to be non-collaborators with evil. Epiphany, you know, means a sudden manifestation or perception of the essential nature or meaning of something. What is revealed to us today is that God's law must first and foremost dictate our ethics. And sometimes that will require our civil disobedience. That's our epiphany with a small e. Epiphany with a capital E was on January 6th, um, though we're celebrating it today. The epiphany uh, church season is all about the man manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles as first represented by the coming of the wise men. History, you see, has always been about politics and religion. The gospel is intensely political. Let us learn from the wise men and their civil disobedience. My prayer for all of us today is that our Christian religion, gleaned from the gospel of Jesus Christ, must always inform our politics. May it be so. Amen. Let us join our hearts together for these moments of prayer. Lord of bright and abiding light, you have shown us in the person of Jesus, your son, a new way to live. You have put exemplars like uh, the wise men before us. You have poured your light into the world and have asked us to live in the light rather than run and hide in the darkness of doubt and despair. You promise to be our light all of our days and ask us to place our trust in you. The journey in this light is risky. It means that we will have to be very serious about our service to you, giving you our best and offering hope and light to other people. In this new year, we pause for a moment and bring to you the names and the situations of others for whom light seems to be a stranger, at least for the time being. Bless all of those that we have named in our hearts today who struggle in war zones, in disaster areas, with ill health, economic hardships, broken and damaged relationships, loss of loved ones, and anxiety. We place them in your care. Let your light shine on them. Bring healing and hope. Help us to be bearers of that light in all that we do. For we ask this in the name of the one who taught us to pray in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Hear now the benediction. The holy mystery we call God is a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge for times of trouble. Go, embraced by the source of life, love and hope, following in the way of Jesus, just and compassionate, encouraged by the spirit of grace and wisdom. Amen.